Hello, I'm John Moore, Head of Grounds and Gardens at Churchill College. I'd like to welcome you to a tour around the college grounds and gardens, looking at what we're doing, how we're doing things nice and environmentally friendly, and how we're trying to improve our environment as we go. We're at the moment, we're standing on top of the uh, Muller Institute's tower, as it gives you a view of the site and gives you a, feel, a real feel for the scale of the college. So as we look around, we are covering nearly 50 acres on this site when we include our storage way properties that back directly onto the grounds. So at the top end up here, we have our rugby pitch. And as you look around, it goes down to our football and you'll see various trees all the way around. So we're completely tree covered as you go around covering Maddenley Road that's over there. You'll see there's the long grass where we grow the meadow plants and have the meadows. And as you go around again, you'll just see different areas of interest it takes us onto our cricket field where again we're getting ready for a game of cricket today and again you see more of the trees that are going down around the perimeter. Then it goes down further into the college where the main buildings are and in there you can see lots of trees popping out through the roofs of the courtyard so between in the courtyard you'll see the trees are there. So on this site we're really lucky because we're managing to incorporate all aspects of horticulture and groundsmanship. So behind us here we can see all our amazing sports fields that are maintained to an immaculate standard. And as we come down into the college we come across a very large herbaceous border which gives us complete flower throughout the summer. This flowers through from sort of April, May when it starts with some of the agapanthus and various things that we've got here through the alliums and it goes through to the, uh, all the um, salvias as we got back here. But it basically just flowers right through to the first frosts and it just gives such an amazing impact for people to look at. So people really enjoy this area of the college as they're walking around and into it. So we're now walking into the master's garden, which is a quite a formal garden. We have, pond, we have several ponds in this garden, one here and one the other side of the building here. Again, it's really important that we get ducks and things like this coming here. We also have hedgehogs that we've had in this garden. The sides of this pond are completely straight up, so there's no way they can get out. So we make sure we have a plank of wood and you'll see the, pot, the hedgehogs or the ducks walking up and down the plank to get out if they fall in or if they're going for a swim. As we walk into the garden, we have various borders in here. We have the Sir Winston Churchill border here, which is our national collection of plants named after Sir Winston Churchill, which we have through plant heritage. And then over here, we have the more sort of formal borders of, or mixed border, showing lots of flowers and color as you look down into the garden. But even in a formal garden like here with the nice lawns, we still have a fantastic tree in the middle, but underneath it, we have long grass and the idea is that even in a formal garden like this you can have a haven for wildlife so we'll have all sorts of different things living in here again the lawns you'll see them people won't thank me for pointing it out but you will see that there are weeds in this lawn we haven't sprayed these for many many years uh, and just we just mow them and uh, scarify them just general maintenance but we try and avoid to use any chemical on the main on these lawns we are now standing in the back gardens of the Storys Way properties and at the moment we're in the Shaoshan Fu garden which was created a few years ago after a very generous donation from an alumni called Shaoshan Fu. So this garden has been flowering beautifully but what we've tried to do with these gardens is we took all the fences, they used to be, basically used to have fences between each garden so whereas it was 0.6 of an acre over there, 0.6 of an acre here, then another 0.6 and then another 0.6. We've opened up the entire site. This allows the wildlife to freely move around between the areas so that we're not enclosing them. We don't want to have physical barriers for them to be able to walk through. So as we transition from these gardens here which are full of flower, formal lawns which are nicely mown into stripes, we move across into this area here which is our orchard. In here, the houses that are around this area were built in a sort of 1930s area. So all of these trees are that sort of age of planting. So they are quite old. We never spray for any insects on these, so we've never treated them for anything like uh, woolly aphid that things get. We prune them once a year. We get fantastic crops of apples, pears, plums. We have green gauges. We have a mulberry tree over there. We have a whole gambit of the fruit things and all of this is available for the students and staff to pick 
Underneath it, we leave the grass long. We have just recently cut it. So we grow this as a bit of a meadow area. In the spring, we have the, all the different bulbs that come up here through the crocuses and various other daffodils and things. It then has some wild flowers that come in. We cut little pathways to walk through them. And then about now-ish, we take the first sort of hay crop off it. And then we will just cut it to a, a, a long length. We won't try and cut it formally and it'll just allow it to keep the grass down and the wildflowers that are in here to naturally grow underneath. We then transition again through, which is part of it. These are the student vegetable gardens. So the students get given an area where they can grow their own fruit and veg. They grow what they like and they obviously harvest it, maintain it, weed it, pick it and harvest it. This is something that's been really popular. We've been doing this for quite a number of years now. This year we extended the number of raised beds they've got. Um, so they so had more and more people that are starting to sign up to it. And in the background, we have their greenhouse, which uh, they can grow all their various things. And you can see in here, they're growing tomatoes mainly, uh, and they're starting to do really well. So this is again, something that's really nice for the students, that they can come in here, pick the fruit, grow their own vegetables, and just generally interact with nature in this area as, as and when they like. So again, as we move through from the vegetable and orchard area, we come through into the next garden. In here, we have our beehives. So over there, as you can see, the bees are happily, busily going backwards and forwards, picking up their honey. We've got essentially three, four hives and a couple of nukes that we're going as we're trying to breed some new queens that are a bit friendlier than one of our other hives. In this garden as well, we've, which we've, you can see is rather overgrown. There's more fruit trees in here. But what we're doing is we're letting it grow this year to see what comes up in the wildflowers and what we actually have because we want to create turn this whole area into a wildlife garden so we want to have a small pond in here and lots of wildflowers so again the bees have somewhere to forage somewhere to go and get their water but again it'll just be another nice wildflower area with lots of uh, native plants in here and we'll just cut some small sort of walkway paths through the grass so people can just walk through it and sit and chill in here and enjoy the wildflowers and listening to the insects and wildlife chirping around the place. So we're here today to do our weekly inspections of our beehives. Nikki is about to give a little bit of smoke to the front of the hive just to let them know that we're coming in and to hopefully calm them down a bit. So our next job is to start dismantling the hive so we can get down to the brood box, which is where the queen lives and she's laying her eggs. So that's what we're gonna do next. As you can see, it's, they're quite hard to split these. And what it is, is the, the bees propolis up the hives. So we have to use our hive tool to crack this off ready so that we can then lift off the top. So we're now lifting off the area where the stores are so we can get down to where the queen is. And we'll be leaving our queen excluder on top because that way, if she's on there, she can't get out and escape. So now we can take off the queen excluder, which again is propolist on. We now just put the queen, the queen excluder down near the front so they can fly back in as and when they want. Gotcha. We just lifted out the, high, the first one of the first frame out here. We're looking for the queen to see if she's on there. She shouldn't be, she should be where the brood is, which is where all her eggs are and the end one should be just mainly stores. So she's not on here. We can see lots of bees with pollen on them. Um, and we'll just put this then onto our uh, uh, hanger at the back to store it, whilst we then work our way down through the, the system. So in this frame here, as we get further into the center of the hive, we can see that there's the capped brood in here and next to it we've got little larvae in there which is the sort of early stages and next to that there will be little eggs so the larvae look like little maggots that are curled up 
like little seeds, nice and white, and the eggs look like little grains of rice. So we'll put this one back in and we'll carry on looking down the hive. So we've now lifted out the last one in the uh, last frame in the brood box and this one is all caps. It's really quite heavy to lift um, and as you can see on here that uh, it's all capped. So underneath this you would scrape this when you want to harvest the honey. You would scrape off the top of this and then you'll be able to extract the honey from it. So obviously the bees are getting quite uh, flighty now. Uh, we haven't seen the queen this time. We don't always see her on our inspections because she can move around quite quickly and she tends to stay in the darker areas. So that is the inspection of the bottom one. We've seen, we've seen good capped brood. We've seen little um, larvae and we've had eggs. So we know that the queen's in there. We know she's laying and we know that this is a healthy hive at the moment. So we'll now rebuild it back up to look in the top box. So as we're putting these frames back on, we have to make sure that all of the frames inside are running the same way. So we don't have one facing one way and one lot facing the other. Make sure we've got a tight seal on the top and it's back together. We'll then have a quick look in this top box where it should be full of stores, hopefully. Yeah. So here is the top where you can really see the honey in here so at the top you can see that they've capped it and lowered and round it you can see it's still very wet where it's been converted so this is going to be quite a nice crop of honey on this bit as you can see and they're still building it out here it's much more capped as an example this is what it goes in as to start with as a as a plain frame so we put this in with foundation on it they then pull out the areas and make the cones and then fill it with honey so you can see how this is completely flat when it goes in and then how they convert it to what they need. There we go. We've moved further across and across the gardens in Story's Way and we're now standing in what is a college's vegetable garden. This area has been maintained and grown by the catering department as they want to actually get really involved in the growing of the, of the produce and then be able to see how it's grown and then produced and then actually take it up to the kitchen to use. Obviously we can never manage to produce enough to feed the entire college but what we can do is have dinners, special dinners and uh, occasions where we can use the, the produce from the gardens. So in here we've got things like Swiss chard that's grown really nicely, we've had some great beetroots, we've got some small potatoes over there, crops, and again courgettes. So the idea is that we, although we're not going to feed the entire college, but we are reducing our food mileage by growing some of the food here, and it's really helping everyone connect with what they eat. So we want people to see what has grown, how it looks, and then take it to the table. So again, this is another thing that we're really keen to expand. So we will hopefully over the years get slightly bigger than this, but unfortunately we do not have the space to feed the entire college. So we now have been moving into having green roofs around the site. So we're experimenting with different types and different depths. So on here at the moment we're looking at a bike shed. So this year we've put on a sedum roof. This is great because again it adds more biodiversity up here. You get the flowers and things for the bees and the wildlife. It also helps with water runoff and management. So we're looking at various flat roofs around the site to start moving out further to have more flat ro uh, green roofs around the site. So this is Michael Westmore, the college's head gardener, and he's using a hot water machine today to do the weed killing. This is a part of our drive to stop using chemicals, which we have stopped using on site now for about two to three years. Um, so here he goes with his hot water machine. So since we start, I started at Churchill College, we've not used a lot of chemicals of total weed killers. We've been trying to reduce their use and reliance year on year, 
and about three or four years ago we decided that we would go total weed killer free on the site. Part of the process of doing this is that we decided we would look around for alternative methods of weed control and one of the ones that we chose was this one here which is a hot water machine. It uses no chemicals, it just has hot water. So it heats up to 98 degrees and this works by expanding the, the cells in the plants so they explode and it then actually just kills the plant. So it goes to a very sort of from a nice lush green plant there and you'll see it starting to go to a darker colour and then eventually it will just collapse and die. If it's a perennial people say will it kill it? It takes two or three applications to do it, it will come back but as you can see here the effectiveness. The good thing about this is not only we're only using hot water on the site so we don't have to worry about runoff or anything like this, there's no protective clothing that's needed when, uh, to, to do this job except for a pair of thick gloves to protect you from any of the hot water when touching a pipe. So here he goes up the path and you can see broadleaf weeds are just slowly collapsing under the temperature. So as part of our environmental policy of trying to reduce our carbon emissions, over the last few years we've been using electric or battery operated hedge cutters, strimmers and leaf blowers and now just out is the uh, first battery mower with a roller. So here we have a, a hater mower with a battery and a rear roller. In this compartment is where the huge battery is which just slides out and then drops back in. They're fantastic machines and Michael here is about to start it up so you can just see how it works. One of the one things that's really good about this is the noise levels. They're really quite quiet and you can hear me talking over it. So we have lower noise with these, we have less vibration and it's just such a much nicer machine to use with no fumes or any and less pollution. So around the site we've been putting up bird boxes and various other habitat areas for, for the wildlife to, to live in. So just back here we have a, 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 a bird box on the building. In here we always either get uh, blue tits or great tits. We've also got lots of bird boxes in various trees around the site and this is something that we're aiming to continue this year along with other habitat areas and uh, homes like things like hedgehog boxes that we're intending to be putting around the site. So here we have a silver birch that was planted in about October 2020. At the bottom of it you'll see a green object. This is actually is called a hydration bag. So what work, how it works is it has a gap at the top here and this holds 70 litres of water. And the idea is that we fill it up once a week giving it an, an absolute amount of water that we know is a guaranteed amount and underneath it it has tiny little pinprick holes and it takes between three and four hours for it to drain out onto the tree. Because of the nature of it draining so slowly we don't get any water loss whereas if you watered this directly with a hose or a watering can the water would spread around everywhere and go everywhere so you would waste quite a bit. This gives a very directed slow penetra deep, sort of deep penetrating water for the tree. We found this to be very successful around the site for when we have it. It also helps us of course identify which trees we've planted recently so the person that's going around watering doesn't miss any but these are just an absolute really useful tool for watering and saving water. We're at the start now of our perimeter path that we have built in 2020. This path was built for the purpose of allowing students and people to access the full site. So we have such a vast area that most people just don't go to. We have the sports fields which are well used, but we have areas which are really nice and tr normally tranquil without the traffic going past, where actually people just didn't uh, appreciate. And one of the things that we found from creating this uh, perimeter path was it allowed us to hang a huge number of different environmental areas and things off it. So one of the things we really wanted to do was create wildflower areas along it. We had for many years just left the grass long in these areas but we wanted to actually start increasing what we were doing and the biodiversity of the areas by planting plug plants. So we had different options of how we achieved this method 
and we tried two different areas. So behind, just to the side of me here, this area we actually raised up the ground a bit from some surplus soil from the path because we wanted to give it a little bit more of a mound to give a bit more protection to the residents in Cowan Court for the views in. And on this area here we sowed a wildflower mix which was an 80-20, so it was 80% uh, wildflower, wild grasses and 20% wildflowers. So this will take a number of years to, to actually really get going. There's a few annuals that have come up, the poppies, the the chamomile and things like this, but the, the perennials will come through. It was a perennial mix and we'll see those coming through and starting to take over. But this will take slightly longer to get going, but it's going to be a nice entrance to the area. As we then start to walk along the path, what we decided to do with the main area, particularly where we had long grass for many, many years, I mean, this has been left long for as long as I've been here, so for 25 years, this area has had no weed killer, no fertilizer, or anything like that. It's just been left to grow long. And then about sort of July, August time, it's been cut down and almost treated as a meadow, but without the sort of wild flowers in it. So we decided that this was an ideal area to start our wildflower mix putting in. So on this, we decided we would go for plug planting. So we basically bought just about eight, just over 8,000 plug plants covering probably about 15 to 20 different species of different plants in here. We chose them for different areas. So in this bit here, it's a very, very wet area. So we chose ones that would be happy in heavy clay and sort of very wet conditions. In this area, we, what we did is we cut the grass down really short in the spring, uh, which when we were planting them in this sort of April time, we then marked out swathes through here of either a metre wide or two metres wide and we then uh, marked them out in different lengths and they could have been 10 metres up to 30 metres in length. We were then, once we'd done that, we could scarify the areas so we could really scarify it hard to make sure that the soil was there fully exposed. We used no weed killers to do anything like that and then we were really lucky because our student population they want, we off, offered them the option to come out and join us and do some planting of these and we had a huge take up and this was really nice because obviously it was a Covid year and because we had them all into sections of, uh, of swathes it meant we could number each one and we could then designate areas to, to students so we gave them all their individual trowels and gloves, we made up little selection boxes of plants um, and we explained to them we were doing five per metre and that they could just randomly plant them through their swathes, which they did. And this year we've seen a number come up. Uh, we've had quite a few things flowering. We've had oxide daisies. We've had some knapweed. We've had the red campion, the white campion, and various other things, ragged robin. And particular success this year has been the yellow rattle. And the yellow rattle is very important for this sort of area because with that, it actually suppresses the grass. It's a parasite and it parasitizes the roots of the grass and it slows it down. So that's a really important thing. Uh, at the moment, it's rattling nicely with the seed in there. So we're gonna be spreading it because it is an annual and it will hopefully start spreading and we'll see things slowing down. But as I say, we were confident in this area because it had been left so long for so long that the grass isn't a thick sward. So we thought that they would cope with it and they would actually be able to grow and survive. And they have done that really well. I've stopped at this point here because one of the things that's been quite amazing over here is we never used to walk over here in the, during this time of year because there wasn't really the great need or want to walk over here. And what's happened is since we've done this, we've seen various orchids come up. So we found, we knew we had them over here of the bee orchids, but we've had about 15 or 20 of those that we found. And this year, for the first time, I've never seen on the site before, we've had 10 pyramidal orchids come up and they're still flowering in there uh, at the back. So we've got various clumps along this area, which has been an amazing thing to come up. They've obviously probably, or more than likely flowered here every year, as long as I've been here. But because I've not been over here at the right time, we haven't seen it. We've also been seeing the vetch that we planted coming up. Uh, and then here's the yellow rattle, which is just coming up and it's just really taken over this whole area, which is great. And it has a little, little rattle, as you can hear there, which is why it's named. So that's gonna full of seed, that's virtually ripe. 
in another few weeks or so, we'll be cutting this down. We'll then let it dry out so the seeds can drop and then we'll rake it over and then we'll just have to keep it cut to a, a, a not, not short, but a reasonable height. So that will then just then see it through. One of the great things again, with the, with the fact that we had such a, a fantastic uptake from the students was the fact that um, we're intending to plant loads of bulbs this year. So we're going to probably plant a minimum of 10,000, probably many more of native bulbs. So we're going to be planting in these areas because where we just come past, we've just passed the taxodiums, which is the swamp cypress. I know they're not natives, but we're trying to have a diverse collection of trees. But in there, they really like it wet. And that actually sits physically wet and underwater for most of the winter. So we'll be putting in things like the Fritillaria milagris, which is the snake's head Fritillaria, which likes a sort of water meadow feel to it. So that will do really well in there. And then along the sides, we'll be able to plant things like the native daffodil. We'll put in the native bluebells and we'll have things like the snowdrops. So this is going to be a really interesting area because you're going to walk along this at any time, this path, and you'll come here in the spring, you'll see the bulbs, they'll be all flowering, you'll impress with these. Once they go over, you'll start to see some of the newer things like the, the, fox, um, the um, uh, primroses and cowslips that we've planted along the edges. So we've planted these along the edges where the grass doesn't outgrow them, we don't lose them into the area, and you'll start to see them coming up. Once they start going over, we'll then start to see things like the oxide daisy coming up and all the other plants that we've put in. Again, once we get to this point, we've planted no end of trees uh, in here. So we planted last year 107 trees and along this path we planted probably 70 trees and a part of those we planted uh, over 50 malus trees, which are crab apples, and we planted over 10 different varieties. So with these, in the spring they gave us a fantastic show of flower, which was really nice to see. We'll then get the fantastic berries and fruit in the uh, autumn, and we'll get autumn colour. So this is just going to continually add to what we're getting. We have uh, already got a load of, a lot of maturish trees around us, like the beach and things like this here. With this area, we're allowing, one of the important things for biodiversity is that we don't over prune them um, and dead wood them. So if it's a safe area, we will always leave dead wood in here because we all know that there's lots of insects out there that like dead wood to live in. But actually the most important is dry dead wood, which is what you get in trees. Because most people are too worried about it falling. So if it's safe, we will always leave it in. Equally, there's a tree back up here, which is the big white willow. And you can see in there, there's no end of uh, woodpecker holes. Again, the tree is safe. We check it and we monitor it. But again, we leave the woodpecker holes in there. It's another area for biodiversity and for the animals to live in. But we, uh, we're encouraging the fact that we want to have wood, the dead wood in trees for the animals and insects. We're also allowing dead wood on the ground. We're creating log piles about the place. Again, this then goes into the fact that when we get things like our hedge, we're going to create hedgehog boxes, but having the log piles is a natural area for them. And again, in this area, one of the things, because at the moment we're applying to become a hedgehog friendly campus status. So we're aiming for our bronze award this year. So we'll be uh, putting our application in, in December. And some of the things that they say that you really need to make sure you encourage to have on the sites are things like wildflowers because it brings in the animals, the small insects and various things that the hedgehogs will eat. Also, they like the fact that we to have things like beech trees, which we've got plenty of here because they have a, a small leaf and the small leaf is really important for hedgehogs. They don't want huge leaves like they have on the plane tree here. They want the small ones to make their little hibernation areas and their little day beds and which they'll stay in. So they'll be happily living in this area of long grass. They'll create little areas to sleep and they'll stay overnight. Or again, for hibernations, they'll go into our log piles and things like this. Again, as we've walked along this whole area, this hedge along our boundary is field maple, which is native again. So we have a huge native hedge, which allows for various birds to nest in. And we, you know, we, we try not to cut it too frequently to keep it as a tight hedge though. We want it to, you know, fill out again, allowing the insects and various wildlife. As I alluded to, we were very interested in the trees on this site, and uh, 
one of the things we were doing when we were surveying a number of years ago, we realised because we had a policy of every time we took a tree out that we would try and plant three, not necessarily in the same spot, but we tried to do three, every time we had to remove a tree because it died, it was dangerous or something was wrong with it, we'd plant three. So we were increasing steadily across the site and this actually gives us the age diversity which is really important because this is a new college, 60 years old and no end of trees were planted when it was first built and of course that can cause you a problem that suddenly you can have a lot of trees coming towards the end of their life all at once which is not something you want so you need to be planting regularly throughout your time and again we'll plant different sizes and different uh, types of trees again that's the other thing that we're wanting to do is have a huge diversity of trees because we have got climate change and things like this coming now so something that was classed as as uh, really coping well and doing well here can suddenly struggle so with things like beech they're a very shallow rooting tree they could become a problem in later life when we have water shortages uh, equally we've got things like um, ash dieback we've had again so we could end up losing a lot of our ash trees we've seen that with dutch elm disease so we don't want to suddenly say we're going to plant all natives because they may not survive so well Things in the past that used to say were hardy in these, were, were tender in these areas. Now people are saying actually they're quite hardy and they'll survive, particularly where we are in this part of the country. So we're seeing the temperatures and things changing and that things surviving that you never would have risked planting before. So going back to our tree numbers, as we found that we were going up, a number of, few, about two or three years ago, we actually thought we're getting a large number on site. We should set ourselves a goal um, of, of planting a thousand trees by about another it was another two years so last year we put in 107 trees uh, and that took us to a total of 930 on the site so this year we need to plant another 70 trees which will take us to our thousand a uh, thousand uh, tree target this is not just a set goal to get to a thousand and stop what we're hoping to do is keep going and say until we've run out of room we'll keep planting as many as we can. We've been very lucky because a part of, the, of, of this, we went out to our alumni and we said to them, you know, we're planting all these trees, would you like to support us and help us? And we actually managed to, within a couple of weeks of asking the alumni, they donated money to us and we hit our target to pay for all the trees within about two weeks. So that covered the cost for the college. Um, as I say, we got, we're not just stopping at these things, we've, Last year we planted, basically we did a, a 1.3 acres we covered of wildflowers. Our target again is about five acres on this site. So again we, we've, said, we've set a target but we will go past it if we can but we, you know, we're wanting to get to that area. So behind us here we have the football pitch which is a bit further up. Again this is an area we cut the grass, we keep it short but actually it's, you know, we leave it a little, it's just been cut actually today by the looks of it because of the stripes, but we tend to keep this a little bit longer, but actually it's not doing a lot for us for wildlife, you know, it's a little bit, we've got weeds in the back. I mean, on the sports fields, what we tend to find is that we, we've done for the last few years now is you have to keep them to a certain standard. So, as I say, we don't use weed, total weed killers on the site, haven't done for a number of years now, but on the sports fields, we have to keep them to a set standard for the for sport. So on there, we've, we're doing sort of, we're trying it out. We've done it every two years for a number of years now that we spray. So every two, year, second, every two years, we'll get just the sports pitches, not the surrounds, and we'll spray them, have a company spray them. We're going to try and extend that year every so often. So next year, we're gonna to go to three years just to see how it works because we don't want to be having to spray if we can avoid it, but equally, we can't afford the pitches to standards to fall. So in this area here, we'll probably we'll see we'll be extending this up here. So we'll be extending the wildflower mix onto here. We'll be planting trees on it as well to add to the thickness of our boundary and our tree belt towards Madden Lee Road. But one of the things we'll find on this is that when we planted the wildflowers on the other side, where we planted them in the area just to here, we found that the sward was quite thin because it hadn't been cut. It was under trees and the wildflowers did well. The other side of the path we'd cut in the past and the sword became thicker. And what we found is that the grass didn't grow as well there for length 
and the wildflowers have struggled more. So on this side, what we will do is we will mark out the areas that we want to plant the, the wildflowers, like we did on the other side, but we'll just scratch the top off with a, with a mini digger. We'll take the turf off and we will plant in there. And then we'll also sow some native grasses as well within it. We won't scratch the whole lot off. We'll just do where we're planting. And this will allow them to get hold and get it growing before the other grasses come back in again. And we'll start to see the system take over. So this whole area will then become a, a much wider area of wildflowers, which again, will just add to the biodiversity that we're creating. As I say, going back to the hedgehogs, we're intending around our compost areas to have huge log piles there. At the back, we can allow some of the brambles to grow because again, that's the sort of thing they live in because it gives them protection. They can get in there and other animals that may want to attack them won't go in after them. So they feel at home and they feel secure and they just enjoy life in there. So with our compost bins area here, we were really keen to hide them because they're not the most attractive of items. So we had the possibility of getting a lot of soil. We had cow and court being built at this point, as long as well as the Muller, uh, Muller Institute was having its extension. So we had thousands of tons of soil to get rid of. And again, we didn't want it to be going off site because that creates huge amounts of road miles uh, and haulage. So we actually had it all brought over here. And this area being flat at one point, we managed to create huge mounds all the way around it. So as you look at the from anywhere in the college across the site, you can't actually see these compost bins. They're completely hidden. This is a huge area that we have that we basically compost all of our uh, weeds and grass. We make sure that every bit of rubbish that we create, whether it be prunings from trees or hedges, if it's something like that, we'll then shred it. So it'll go into this area. We'll have all the wood chips. Again, this then can be put on the borders as a mulch or it can go around the trees, which helps us uh, maintain moisture. Also adds a little bit more fertilizer and feed to the ground. Also has an attractive look to it. As we work our way down, we're into different, different years of compost. So it tends to last in here for about, it takes about a year for it to rot down totally. Uh, this autumn, we'll be using these two here, which are quite em enormous bays. Each of these are probably about 16 foot squared, roughly. I think they're about eight, eight feet at each sleeper and about best part of nearly six foot high. So you can see how huge they are. The end bay was the one that we had last year. We didn't get to use it all, but you could just see the fantastic compost we create, which again, we're managing to put onto our gardens to feed the borders, add um, the uh, organic matter into it and just keep recycling the whole system. And again, it helps us maintain the water in the ground. But these are just absolutely fantastic. The one thing we are finding, although these look huge, that we are struggling with them a bit, being a bit on the small side for us. So we are this year looking at extending them to make them a little bit bigger and come out one more sleeper. So as we continue along the path, and it's an amazing thing, there's nearly 700 meters as we go along, we come to different areas. So we're going through underneath these trees and between them. And as you can see along this area, what we've done is we've mowed small strips either side. So it makes it feel a bit more formal, but also stops the plants all flopping onto the path because this path is only 1.5 meters and we don't want people getting wet legs as they're trying to get along it. But also the fact that we leave this to go long here and readiness for next year, we can see what comes up. So we'll see if we're going to have things like orchids pop up. We can see if there are already wildflowers in this area and we can again, we can see how it's going to react and if we're going to have to take off the top level of, uh, of grass and things or if like here it looks exactly like we'll be able to plant directly straight into the grounds with the plugs. So again this is going to be another area that we can plant up as we're going around. So you'll feel as you're going down this whole path it's a tree sort of laden area. So it's basically a complete pathway with trees following around. You'll be submerged and um, emerged rather in um, in wildflowers and again back of the rug football pitch where we just looked at we're getting we will probably look to create and cut small walkway sort of rides through it so that you can actually get up close and personal with the uh, wildflowers because we don't want people just to be able to look from a distance and equally we don't want people trampling through them all so we're going to give people that access by just cutting little grass paths so as we come towards the very end of the path and we're up near the chapel, you can see to our right here how we have trees still in the very short grass where we keep it mowed. But actually, we, again, we're letting long grass grow underneath there. 
So again, it's another wildlife haven. So as the wildlife and insects or whatever it is, or small animals, they scurry across this short grass, they can get in there for a bit of cover and a bit of shelter. So this is something that's again, really important that we've got short grass, but actually we've still got long grass within it. We're gonna come along this bit here and we're gonna drop down into the sort of copse area where we can see where we've been doing some more tree planting and also there's already a lot of bulbs that have been planted in the past. So in the area that's been over the years affectionately known as the sort of copse area, which is just a sunken area where we've had various trees. We've tried to rename it now to our small arboretum. And what we've done over the year, last few years is we've been planting trees in here and we've done it into zones. We've got in here, we've got all the cornices which have the fantastic bracts for flowers. So we've got different types of them here. Once you go through there, we actually have a, a golden rain tree here, the Colrutia, which is just flowering at the top. And then we go into the sort of acer section. So the acers like the fact that it's got dappled shade in here, which is just really nice for them. And it just adds that bit of extra. They go a bit further down this way and then through to the magnolias. One of the things you'll notice is, well, is that we have a bark path in here. And the reason we put this in is partly because many years ago, there was about 20,000 daffodils were planted in here, which makes a fantastic show in the spring. And before those, there's absolute thousands and thousands of snowdrops. But people, again, couldn't really get in and enjoy them. So you'd see people walking around the outside of the bank or trying to tiptoe their way through them all. And we wanted to make it accessible. So we put in this park path that went round it so people could get inside, people could get in there, take the photographs and just actually enjoy it. Again, we used to cut this down once the daffodils were finished and we just used to keep it kept a bit lower. Um, at this year, we've let it grow and haven't cut it at all this year yet. And uh, lo and behold, we had two uh, pyramidal orchids pop up in here as well. So they're obviously quite happy on this site. And along here, a lot of people will say that this looks really scruffy in here, but actually it's fantastic habitat. So we've left it here. We've got the nettles, which are great for certain butterflies. We've got ivy again, which is fantastic ground cover for animals and things, creatures to creep in and under. You look up into the tree, there are small dead branches up here. They're of no danger to anybody because if they do fall, they'll fall into an area that's not on the path and they're not gonna actually injure anyone. So we're happy with that. It's quite stable and quite sturdy, that dead wood. So we'll leave it for the moment. We monitor it yearly and we keep an eye on it, but we'll make sure where we can, we'll keep it. So again, we've got the wildflowers through here. We'll have, this year we'll have wildflowers planted in this area. So again, it'll add to the interest. So we'll have all those bulbs. And uh, once we've got those through, it'll come into the wildflowers. Again, here we had a tree that showed a branch which wasn't happy. We took the branch down and we've just left it lying there. So it can just create a bit more of a habitat there. You know, it's not doing anybody any harm. You know, as gardeners, we can be far too tidy. And if you've got a site like this, we can afford to be scruffy in a few places and actually just dedicate it to the wildlife. Again, you've got ivy growing up trees, all these things that people would say we shouldn't do and that we're in a college or in a university. We should be making sure everywhere is immaculate and tidy. But that's not totally what things are about always. It's about actually working with your environment and trying to enhance it. You know, and this is what we're aiming to do here. So where we can, we'll leave the dead wood, we'll leave dead branches lying around, we'll create log piles, we'll let the grass grow long, we'll allow certain weeds to grow within the grass, we won't go around spraying. And we're finding the benefits of it because we're seeing much more insects, we're seeing more butterflies, we're seeing various things. You go along, we see grass snakes, it's just an absolute sort of wildlife haven. So this is something that we're really benefiting from. The one thing that we haven't done and we're about to do is actually have a proper wildlife survey because we want to actually see what we've got and actually see what we're improving and actually see the tangible benefits for what we've, uh, what we've done and what, we've, uh, what we're putting in. So I hope you've enjoyed your, your tour around the gardens and you've learned a few things that we're doing about the site. I'd just like to thank all the people that have been involved in the filming, the planting and all the other things that we do around the site and the support we get from our alumni and donors. Thank you very much.